YouTuber David Wilbur did a video responding to my and other affirming scholars' interpretation of Leviticus 18.22, and I want to respond to his video showing you why the non-affirming argument doesn't actually hold water. Objection 1. Leviticus 18.22 condemns homosexual acts only in the context of idolatry and temple prostitution. Reverend Brandon Robertson has argued that the Bible does not condemn homosexual behavior as morally wrong per se. It is condemned only in its association with pagan fertility cults. Robertson supports this conclusion by noting that Leviticus 18.22 directly follows the commandment against sacrificing one's child to Moloch. Robertson also notes the warnings against practicing the abominable customs of of the Canaanites at the beginning and end of the chapter. This first point is patently true. The context of Leviticus 18 is unambiguous. It is a condemnation of the practices that are being done in ancient Egypt and in ancient Canaan. In neither culture was homosexuality broadly permitted. So Leviticus 18.22 can't be condemning broad homosexuality because that was not permitted in those cultures and there would be no reason to condemn it. What was common in both of those cultures were two types of homosexual activity. One is temple prostitution or sex to honor gods and goddesses. This is likely one of the contexts that the author of Leviticus 18 was thinking of when he thought about same-sex sexual behavior in ancient Egypt and Canaan. The other context that was broadly permissible in many ancient cultures was men to have sex with men of conquered nations, slaves, and younger people. This was permitted as a way to show dominance over that other culture, that other people that had been conquered. This is something that was permittable in Egypt and in Canaan, and that is one of the only and clearest contexts where same-sex sex was permitted in those cultures. Therefore, it is likely that this is what the author of Leviticus is condemning. It should also be noted that as it says in Leviticus 18.21, do not sacrifice your child to Molech for this is an abomination, that there is an idolatry context to the prohibition against same-sex sexual behavior. If you actually look in almost all the references to so-called homosexuality in the Bible, it's always linked to idolatry. However, as Dr. Robert Gagnon writes, quote, few today give this argument much credence and for good reason. It should also be noted that the main scholar that David uses in his video is Robert Gagnon, whose scholarship related to sexuality has been critiqued by a broad range of reputable scholars and is not relied on as an accurate understanding understanding of ancient sexuality. One of the problems with Brandon Robertson's argument is when the commandment against homosexual behavior is repeated in Leviticus 2013, it occurs in the midst of the prohibitions against incest, bestiality, and adultery. This context would indicate that homosexual behavior, like incest and adultery, is condemned as a sexual violation in nature. It is not condemned merely in its connection with pagan cultic practices. It is true that the warnings against practicing Canaanite customs Customs frame the sexual prohibitions given in Leviticus 18, but to suggest that homosexual behavior is condemned only because it is connected with paganism is misreading the text. We don't try to limit the other sexual prohibitions found in Leviticus 18 to this context, so it would be entirely inconsistent to do so with the prohibition against homosexual behavior. Even scholars who affirm same-sex relationships, like Gerald Shepard, acknowledge this fact, as Shepard writes, quote, I do not think that the text in Leviticus can be read from a historical perspective as applicable only to cult prostitution because they stand in the context of other laws regulating general immoral conduct such as incestuous relationships, adultery, and bestiality. It should also be noted that the affirming scholars that he quotes are not well-known affirming scholars. Most Bible scholars do not come to the conclusion that these texts prohibit same-sex relationships in a loving, consensual context. That is the broad consensus of most reputable biblical scholars. So the fact that he can pull a few random affirming scholars that disagree with this interpretation is not a read on how a wide majority of biblical scholars understand these texts. Objection 2. Leviticus 18.22 condemns only homosexual rape, not homosexual activity between consenting participants. Another objection to the straightforward reading of Leviticus 18.22 is to say that the verse intends to condemn only same-sex rape, not homosexual activity per se. As Adam Hamilton writes, quote, It is worth noting that the story of the attempted gang rape in Sodom is the only example of same-sex sexual activity in the Torah up to this point. Could this have 
have been the backdrop to Leviticus 18.22 and 2013? Given that this is the only occurrence of a man lying with a man, is it at least possible that Leviticus 18.22 and 2013 were condemning homosexual rape rather than anything approximating two people sharing their lives in a loving relationship? The answer to Hamilton's question is no. There are a few reasons we know that the aim of Leviticus 18.22 is to prohibit consensual homosexual activity generally. First, according to Leviticus 2013, both participants in the act are to be punished. As Richard Davidson writes, quote, unlike other ancient Near Eastern laws relating to homosexual activity, both parties here are penalized, thus clearly implying consensual male-male intercourse, not just a case of homosexual rape. If this verse were prohibiting rape, then it does not make sense that the victim should be punished. When the Torah addresses rape elsewhere, only the rapist is to be punished. The second argument shows that David doesn't really have an understanding of how sex and gender worked in many ancient cultures in the Near East, including the ancient Israelite culture. In these cultures, masculinity was the highest ideal. To be a man and to be masculine put you at the top of the social hierarchy. The reason Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13 would condemn the active participant, the one penetrating another man, is because that man would be guilty of desecrating another man's masculinity, making the other man like a woman. This was seen as an egregious violation of this high ideal of masculinity. The reason the passive partner would be condemned in either an idolatrous relationship or even an exploitative relationship is because once somebody is penetrated, their masculinity has been stripped. They've become like a woman. They've become feminized. And this is something that is irreversible in most ancient Near Eastern cultures and in the Greco-Roman world of the first century. And so both participants would be seen of violating masculinity. And this was wrong. This would have been seen as an abomination. Now, I don't agree that both participants should be condemned, but that is how the ancients in their construction of masculinity would have understood the situation. It's a flawed way of understanding gender, and it's a terrible way to condemn a victim of sexual violence. But this is likely what was working in the mind of the author of Leviticus, because they lived in such a rigid gender hierarchy. Second, if Leviticus 18.22 intended to prohibit only homosexual rape, we would expect the text to be explicit about this qualification, as we see with other ancient Near Eastern legislation governing homosexual activity. However, the absoluteness of the Torah's prohibitions against homosexual behavior is, quote, unlike anything else found in the ancient Near East or Greece. Contexts that make accommodations depending on active role, consent, age, or social status of the passive partner, alien slave foreigner, and or cultic association. The idea that only homosexual rape is being condemned in Leviticus 18.22 seems to be something that is read into the text instead of naturally gleaned from the text. I also want to note that Adam Hamilton's observation that the only time an actual same-sex sexual relationship occurs in the Hebrew Bible is in the context of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was about rape, is a good way to understand all of the other prohibitions in the Hebrew Bible related to same-sex sexual intercourse. If this is the only example in the entire corpus of the Hebrew Bible that mentions any sort of same-sex sexual relationship, then it is not a jump to deduce that any other condemnation of same-sex sexual relationships is linked to that example. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13 are clearly condemning sexual exploitation and abuse and sex in relation to idolatry. That is the best historical contextual reading of these texts, and that is how they should be interpreted.